Um, so thank you all so much for coming today. Um, this was a session I was able to put together, um, and I was super excited to be able to bring in um, Mark, who is a, a super busy guy, um, you know, a long career of success, and I just thought it was really important for you know, our community to be able to hear from him today. So um, uh, no further ado, um, uh, Mark Belton, formerly of General Mills, probably one of the most like, humble, um, successful guys like I've ever been around. Um, I, I got a chance to meet him a few months ago through another relationship. Um, you know, he invested in our last round. Um, and he has been personally like a, a great mentor and a, and a great advisor to our company. Um, so today we get to hear from him. Um, what we'll do is the first, you know, 40 minutes, like we'll, you know, him and I will chat back and forth. And then um, if you have questions throughout, um, feel free to, to raise your hand and ask. Um, and then the last 10 minutes will just leave strictly for questions. So, um, so Mark. Thank you for being with us today. So this is our, our bootleg mic that we have. So bear with us. Um, we're gonna pass this back and forth. But um, could you just give them a little bit of a little bit of a background on yourself? Yeah. No. I'm a, number one. Thank you. You know, it's a wonderful opportunity to get in uh, and spend some time with the the future innovators and future entrepreneurs and leaders. You know, of the next generation of, of innovation and. Uh, and products and ideas that can hopefully can help transform not only what we do here in the U.S. but beyond. So, uh, so that's a great honor, you know, just to spend some time. Thank you for making that happen. Um, I'm uh, an East Coast kid who came out to the Midwest to work at a company called General Mills back in the 1980s. Um, started at the bottom as a marketing assistant and um, through just a variety of just wonderful opportunities, experiences. I had a chance to work there for about 32 years. I um, started the snacks division for General Mills. I ran some of the biggest brands, Cheerios and the like. I uh, ran Big G Cereals. I had my first shot in an innovation area, actually leading a new ventures group back in the late 90s. Which some of you might not even been born at that time. Um, Most we, of them hadn't been born. Right, hadn't been born, <laughs> right? 1997. <laughs> and uh, we came up against a couple really unique ideas. And the first one that I came up against as a team was uh, this area of organic. And, um, and obviously, you, gotta, you can't even think where General Mills was at the time. But we stumbled on a niche of consumers out on the uh, Northwest, Pacific Northwest. And it was like revelation running into these folks. And we, we did a lot of research, a lot of analysis, and came back and recommended to the organization that we should buy an organic company. Okay, so we were first in that industry. We bought small plant foods, and that's Muir Land Cascade Farm. And that just set up all of the future investments and purchases in the organic space. And I had a chance to lead that area for a number of years. I ran Big G Cereals, which is the mothership of the place. Um, I then had a chance to work in Yo Play. Um, in the glory days of Yoplait, not the more recent ones, but the glory days, where every year we're making 20% growth and knocking the numbers out. I uh, led a health and wellness initiative. I, um, then I got a grouper job, and so I, I started overseeing, you know, uh, marketing, uh, M&A, um, global strategy, and our innovation areas for the company. And uh, you may have heard of one group that we helped start, which was called, which is called Free One Inc. And that's kind of a new venture on the company and an investment on the company. I also, um, while I was working at the mills, was able to start a $100 million investment fund with General Mills, uh, Bristol Myers, and a consulting firm called Sherbrooke Health and Wellness LLC. And we invested in small health and wellness areas in the uh, early 2000s. So I've been in the space for a long time, and uh, I love innovation. I've also failed at innovation probably more than anyone. But um, it's, it's just an area that I just have, I get great energy from. I think because of all the many failures and the few successes, I've got some things to share. And um, now in my new life, you know, after 32 years of doing that, I'm uh, a principal of a small um, consulting firm called Wise Fellows Consulting. It's not really about me, it's about bringing teams of people together to help uh, smaller organizations and nonprofits solve 20 problems and unlock growth things that matter. And so that's what we do. Um, interestingly enough, I get a chance to work with some small companies, and some work and some don't. 
Uh, the big guys still hunt me down, private equity guys and folks like that. They want you know, a certain amount of my time to evaluate marketplace situations, and I'll do that. But I get my energy out of the, uh, the smaller entrepreneurial companies with great leaders and, and ideas and that. So that's what I kind of do. Awesome. So um, let's talk about, so everybody in this room is here, like, either engaged with a startup, you know, have a startup, or, or whatever the case may be. Um, what got you into investing in startups? So obviously you're coming from a transition of, you know, General Mills is, you know, Fortune 50 company, huge. Um, yeah, what got you into the, the itch of wanting to invest in innovation startup companies? Well, you know, it's, um, it's kind of funny. <laughs> I, um, you know, w once you kind of finish that round of your life, you know, that season, you know, you start thinking about, well, where do I get energy? What, what makes me tick? Why am I excited about a variety of different things? And, and from early on, I think there was always this area of creating ideas and creating opportunities to grow. And, you know, even the silliest things, you know, when I was a brand manager on Bugles, my first job, they put me on a business that was getting ready to go out of business. The program was to go out of business. And I figured, you know, that's not good. You know, I've never seen people get promoted <laughs> running businesses into the ground, you know. It'll be a long career doing that kind of stuff. So I worked with a couple of folks on our team, and we found a way to grow the business 23%, uh, make goo gobs of money, and I won an award for results on a business they were trying to kill. You know, and so that was like a first sign, hey, you know, you could do some interesting things. And we did it in microwave popcorn. We did it in another area. Before you know it, you, know, you started developing this reputation of a person who actually could do unique things inside of a company. And so once I got the shot out, um, I wanted to still work in that space of doing entrepreneurial stuff. I also um, thought, boy, there are some interesting ideas that you know, maybe you'll be able to actually help and invest in you know, to create growth and accelerate that one there on the path. And so I just started moving in that direction. And you know, interestingly enough, being in the space and having done a lot of MA and a variety of things, you started you know, catching on catching on to different people and folks you wanted to work with. And it just seemed like that was an area where there was great en energy and um, the opportunities were starting to cr uh, present themselves. And you know, fortunately, I didn't have any you know, material problems. You know, I wasn't, uh, didn't have a gambling problem, wasn't a druggie. You know, I didn't spend all the money I had made at the general for 30 some odd years. So I actually had money to invest right. you know, without actually uh, you know, putting my family at risk or anything. So, so you had resources, you had skills, you knew people, you had some discipline in the space. It just seemed like that would be an area that made a lot of sense. Right. So, um, so let's talk about founders. So there's a lot of founders in the room today. Um, when you're looking at investing in an early stage company, um, founder is the most important thing in the early days. So what are you like? What are some of the traits, like intangibles, that you're looking for? If I'm outside of the best, like everybody knows that the message needs to make sense, but what are some of the intangibles um, that you're looking for in early stage companies? Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. You, you've made an implicit, implicit assumption founders are the single most important thing. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. I think great ideas, okay. <laughs> okay. great ideas are really important. Ideas that matter are important in markets that matter, you know, right. have size, scale. Um, you know, without those, I don't think we have anything. Now that being said, you know, if you have those things, then it really is about, you know, what matters as it relates to leaders. Right. You know, what do you really care about? Um, well, you know, there's some basics. Does the person really have relevant experience in the space? You know, do they really know? You know, something. Um, because, boy, if you've worked in something and you failed in something, you know, it's great. Okay, you, get, you know, you don't have to learn everything all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, well, we tried that, that didn't work. We tried that, that didn't work. We tried that, that didn't work. Well, it's like, well, what will work? What do you know? So you have to have some, I think, this relevant experience in this space. Um, I think there are characteristics of successful people. And interestingly enough, one of them is, and it's not a word people want to talk about anymore, it's kind of a word people don't like, um, humility. You know, I find that lots of people aren't really humble enough to either listen to their consumer or their customer well enough to know what's right and wrong, um, or not willing or 
humble enough to listen to somebody who might have something that could actually help them. You know, um, they have the pioneering spirit, they're passionate, they ground themselves, you know, the sheer willpower to get to a certain point, but, um, but the listening skills are low. And, you know, I've consulted and advised people, you know, um, in one particular business, it was kind of amazing. The person didn't have a lot of wrestling experience, but they made a lot of mistakes and learned fair around. But they added not only that to a lack of humility. <laughs> and so I remember we were out trying to help raise $10 million, and um, it wasn't working. And they were getting feedback from the marketplace. And they also had spoken to a gentleman, John Howard, who runs 301. And John gave them some feedback. And their consultant, who had 30 years in the industry, right? you know, 32 years in the industry, was giving them feedback. And they not really listening, you know? And so I got to a point where I said, well, yeah, this is a very curious thing. Um, folks who write checks are giving you feedback. Folks who are in the corporate side and don't have given you feedback. And your advisor's giving you feedback. And you're still not listening. It's a problem. It's not going to go on for long. You know, eventually, they got shut down. You know, because they were burning money too fast. Everything we told them, and the reason why folks weren't giving the money, you know, they just weren't really willing to hear it. The lack of humility is really a big deal. Um, you know, and, then, and there are obvious other skills. You know, somehow you've got to be, uh, you've got to be scrappy. You've got to have some grit. You know, you've got to know how to make do with what's there or not there and still get to your goal. And, uh, you know, my, my, old, my father, you know, grew up in the South and they never had anything. And one thing he learned from his mother, he was one of nine, was make do. Yeah, 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 you don't have you know, to make do. You don't have to have to make do. He taught me make do, you know, with what you don't have and find a way to get where you need to go. Or, you know, make it do. And that's one of the things the corporates often don't have. The work boys that you know, we never have to say <laughs> you always have everything you need. Right. 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 You've got it all. But if you need something to snap and someone will, you know, get you what you need. But in the real world, make do is a big deal. Right. So, you know, those are some of the skills. But the big one that no one wants to talk about is you know, the recipe of someone you're describing, what's the percent of the population? Like who can listen, who are you know, who have humility, who have experience, like how like how small is this? Give me a name, like, like how many people are like that? Mm -hmm. You've seen so many people over your years. Like how many you use them? Three percent. Some people can work into it, so the pool is actually bigger. Does that make sense? Like, I don't know yeah, that yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. You know what I would say is that there are characteristics of successful people, and those things are learned traits. Right? They're not innate traits. You know, a lot of people think that most stuff is innate, but. And yeah, there are. You know, maybe having that little goofy sense of figuring out how to make things grow that I had even when I was younger, you know, okay, maybe that's a little innate. But most of the character traits are not. Right? Being disciplined, as having humility, being a person of integrity, um, learning to serve people, particularly the folks who work on your teams, servant leadership. Those are learned traits. They're not innate traits. And, and so I think people who have teachable spirits, who are willing to hear from others, and then you know, incorporate those things, they're always thirsting to grow. Um, I think you increase your odds by just being a person who's willing to learn and, um, and, and willing to grow, and having a growth mindset. So I don't know what the percent is, but I know you can change your odds of getting from there to there by making the commitment to do it. That's what I mean. Because it really doesn't matter what the percent. The only thing that matters is you, right? It's kind of like getting married. Hey, what do you think the odds are? <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, the statistics say less than 50, man. OK, what you want to do to make it better? Right? You know, or you just want to be a statistic? Well, I'm glad you're trying to do better. Well, what things would be helpful if you want to make it better? Right? I don't know. Right. Yeah, listen to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, help them. <laughs> That's number one. That's a star. You know, that is a star. You know what I'm saying? I don't you know, use some guy. You know, I'm just an odd person. Well, let me tell you this. You run into fellas, and they go, I don't understand women. You know, you hear all that kind of stuff. And they're married. I don't understand women. I'm like, that doesn't matter. 
You only need to understand your woman. <laughs> you only need to understand one. You ain't got to understand the whole generic. Right? You figure out yours and you got a chance to make it. They had, they had no clue they were coming to marriage contract. Right, right, right. I know, I know. All right, let's get back to the business. Let's get back to the business. But, I mean, I think that's how you improve your eyes, right. by being willing to learn, right. by desiring to grow, by picking up the best of everyone you run into. You know, and, hey, I'm going to take that from this person. I'm going to take that from that person. You know, I'm going to take this from this person. And put that into your toolbox. Right. I, when I went to the mills, that was the first thing I wanted to do. I said, I'm going to build a toolbox of skills of which I know my toolbox is relatively empty. The only thing in there right now is some capabilities and a couple of decent degrees from some fancy schools. But I can build my toolbox by learning from great people. So, you know, I think you, you make your odds, I think. So let's, 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 talk, about, let's talk about companies, right? Oh, all right. Uh, so <laughs> You're like, well, no more marriage. So <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to figure my one out, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. Um, so what are you looking for in companies? So, I'm sure there's a lot of people yeah. who yeah. approach you out of business and say, hey, give me your money, right? <laughs> so so let, let's, let's, let's get that out of the way, right? Yeah. So like, what, what is your thesis? What do you invest in? What don't you invest right. in? Uh, what's important to you? Right. You know, it's, you know um, invest in the thesis. You know, I, I think they're almost all the same um, in many ways. Uh, I do look for things that have, you know, that have markets that matter and have some size and scale. Um, I look for novel ideas. Now, I'm not saying I need disruptive ideas, you know, but I need novel ones, clever ideas that, that matter, you know, for people and, and add some value to a person's life. You know, you do it like Christmas and stuff, you know, what's the job, what's the job to be done, what's the job relevant. You know, I spent time with Clayton, we worked on projects, so yeah, I agree. I just call them novel ideas. You know, the idea is novel, it solves some problem. And the problem that is being solved, um, the person that it has solved it for can say, I value that. It matters to me. Or, you know, and that doesn't matter to everybody. It doesn't matter to those bodies, those people. It doesn't matter enough. Um, I, you know, my, I guess if you go all the way back to your investment thesis, I go, well, you know, there is a J curve and it is actually real. Um, you can do a lot of things to stay on the curve, and you sure can do a lot of things to get off the curve or mess up. You know, looking for businesses that have a reasonable margin structure, I think, is pretty helpful. Um, let's see. I'm just kind of, you know, it's just kind of hard. You're just kind of trying to tick through some of the things. I want to be involved in things I care about. You know, I don't want to invest a whole lot in stuff I don't understand anything about. You know, that's never good. It just adds my lack of knowledge to perhaps the person who's running the things lack of knowledge. That's never good. So I try to stay in some zones, you know, some zones. Obviously, it can be a food zone. That's pretty good for me. And anything that's consumer-oriented, because, you know, basically CPG stuff is consumer-oriented. So I can add value in that kind of stuff. And I get a lot of experience in media and stuff like that. So I try to stay in areas where I, I have some understanding. Um, I really like products that, that really do solve. And, and solve a problem really matter, matter to the folks in that category. I'm a platform person. I like certain pl I like platforms, and I like people who commit to the platform and then mine it until they find, you know, find the right kind of idea. Um, I think people ought to be stubborn about the platform. You know, I, yeah, I thought it through. Is this platform really relevant? Does it really matter? Well, be stubborn about the platform, but be flexible about the idea or the way to solve it. I think what you usually get is people who are pretty loose about the platform, but real stubborn about whatever they've come up with, <laughs> right? And so, uh, so I, I kind of look at that. I want to hang out with and invest in people who I think are the right kinds of leaders. You know, that matters. It really does. You know, and um, and it takes some time to figure out who the right kinds of leaders are. Usually, there are people who have some experience in the space or adjacent the space. Passionate enough to go actually and do what Tom talked about. Um, I'm sure there's some others. If we keep going, I'll probably come up with them. But you know, it, I don't. I think the other thing you're you're an investment. You've got to look at some stuff. You know, you 
got to look at a lot of ideas. You've got to, the more you look at stuff, you've got to be uh, mm -hmm. figuring out what's good. Right. Right. So I want to spend, you know, no more than five minutes, like, talking about diversity, right? So, um, yeah, five minutes, right? Because <laughs> really, most of the people that heard me got back on tangents about being black and tech and that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, and I don't want to take too much of your time. Yeah. Um, but I do want to talk about, you know, obviously you being African American going up the ranks in general bill. And like, what was that experience? Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, it was kind of interesting. You know, this is a great town um, to, to come to. And if you think of me, I came here in 1983, and it was not, not diverse at all, right? I mean, it just wasn't. But the thing I noticed about this town was that people were good hearted people. And, and I said, wow, that's great. I'm a New Yorker of East Coast. You know? <laughs> good hearted people are hard to find, you know? And, uh, and so we had diversity, but we weren't good hearted. And I looked out here and I said, you know, these people are good hearted folks. And I think they're going to give me a shot. I think along the way, the idea of diversity and inclusion and all of these things started to bubble up, not just you know, inside large companies, but you know, across the country. And I think that movement caught me when I was coming along and I kind of was able to catch on and kind of uh, not only help create, but help lead some of those areas. I, you know, I think, um, you know, there are some issues out here. You know, I mean, issues of implicit bias and a variety of different things, which really are tough. You know, they're tough to overcome. And you, whether you're a person of color or a woman or whatever, I mean, you know, they're tough to overcome. Um, but again, as I was talking to the gentleman, they can be overcome, but you must, you must be diligent about learning and developing the skills necessary to succeed. Um, and I was very fortunate to work at a place like Jerry Mills where those values um, were held by the top of the house. And, um, and then I, over the years, I became lucky enough to be a part of the top of the house and take them to the next, to the next level. But they are material, they're really important. Um, I'm an investor and an advisor in a group called the Black Tech Angel Fund. And this is a group of African Americans who are raising money to invest in tech space, because when you look at the data in tech, people of color are underrepresented, underfunded, and get, and aren't a part of the old boy networks to actually get funding. And uh, so that creates a market opportunity for investors, because you've got people with great ideas, and they don't have access to do it. And, um, and so, you know, so I'm investing in things like that, because it needs, you know, a trifecta of benefits for me, right? I've got a chance for a great outsized return, because there are people who can't get this stuff to the table. Secondly, it's consistent with my values as it relates to things like EB&I. And then thirdly, it will create opportunity for other investors and future investors going forward. You know, uh, it is not the United Way. You know, we're here to, we're here to you know, right. not do a United Way. And I love to serve. I love right. serving in my community in this Twin Cities. And you look around and see a variety of things. But when I'm out to make business work, I'm out to make it work. Right. You know, it's not United Way business. We're trying to do it right. We're trying to make money and do it. If we want to give, we'll give generous. Right. But if we're going to work it, the work side, then we're going to do it right. 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 So, so one of the things that were that was impressive to me when we first met as we started to build our relationship was this whole thought that, like, Clarence, I don't just want to give you my money. Um, I want to give you my expertise too, right? Like, if there's something that's challenging for us that fits in my warehouse, um, like, I want you to come to me and. and, 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 and We've already had you know, a session. Yeah, yeah man. Two hour session, board, like, man. Like, oh, we got, <laughs> we literally, we got three phones. Like, we had like, a two hour session with him, Mark Addis, who was former CMO of Jerry Mills. It was like amazing. Um, but can you talk about a little bit about, I know you, like, you, you just said you serve, right? And, yeah. and a lot of people, you know, I've gotten to know you, so I, I've gotten to know that servant side of you. Mm -hmm. um, like, what does that look like out in the community? Because I, I think a lot of times that is, I'm sure like, I just want your money, I want you to shut up a bit long, right? Um, but, but with you, I got a sense of like, yeah, I want to give you my money, but I also want to help you and, and, and kind of serve as much as you need me to serve. So right. what does that look like for you as an investor? Yeah, you know, it's really uneven, you know, because every person who's sitting on the other side, they always, yeah, 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 you'll have opportunities, man. We want your input. Just give me the money, right. you know, and some will actually you know, give you an opportunity to, to help input and influence what's going on. 
and then some it's just part of the pitch. And I've seen both sides. Right? You know, where I'm still waiting for a call. You know, other, than, <laughs> other than the call for the next round or you know whatever, I'm still waiting for a call. Right. And then there are people who are much more open. Um, they see some value in the relationship beyond just you know the economic transaction part of it. And so I'm looking for folks like that. You know, who have that kind of mindset. They're the learners of the world. They're the people who want to grow. And when you run into someone. Hey, you know, I'm I'm not trying, I'm not sitting there, hey man, what are my warrants for this time? You know, I, you know, I charge this much an hour. I'm not doing it for that. I want to see this thing prosper. You know, and I want to see, you know, future you know, entrepreneurs become leaders who will then lead organizations and create jobs, create opportunity, and serve a market. You know, and serve in a way that matters. And so, you know, so when those opportunities come up, I have time for it. You know, I'm getting ready to work on a tech star deal. You know, um, not as an investor, just to advise. You know, I'm not looking for a hand, I'm not looking for cash, I'm not looking, you know, we've been able to make a fair amount in my life. Um, so I'm looking for the right kind of people. So when we actually start meeting some of these folks, I'm going to be looking for that kind of person, you know, as much as the business idea and it doesn't matter, and is it unique, and is it not you know, is it a market that matters. I'm looking for both. Can you tell us more why players? Like, why him? Like, you kind of started talking about, I'm going to push this spot. Because <laughs> you're not going to ask the question, so I will. <laughs> so why him? Of course I'm not going to ask the question. Um, What's the thing? Like, what? Well, I love, okay, well, do you guys know what business he has? Oh, okay, cool. Well, okay, big market, makes a lot of sense, a very novel idea. You could even call it perhaps disruptive. Um, they also had some demonstrated small scale results, which I should have put into my thesis. You know, I'm not a front up, you know, investor where there's nothing out there. You know, I'm looking for stuff where they show. And I, I just saw some unique skills in Clarence's leadership and his approach to the business that I thought were really cool. You know, um, you know, anytime we had a question, bang, there was an answer. The transparency was very high. Every month since we've invested. We get a monthly, hey, what were sales in 17 and what are the numbers in 18? You know, um, every month. I've got other investments that I, that I put in with and I think these will actually work out as well. I can't get anything from these folks. You know, they're West Coast folks and they're, you know, med tech and, you know, they almost kind of treat you like, hey, just, you should be glad you gave me your money. <laughs> you're like, well, do you guys put out quarterlies? Do you guys have a quarterly review? Any number? No, no. And then when we finally pushed him to do one, it was so useless that I haven't even bothered to ask again. I was like, oh, forget it. These guys, all right, I get how these guys roll. You know, I, and what will I hear next? We got another round. You got some more money? <laughs> yeah. Now, the good thing is they said the valuation went from 22 to 33. So I'm like, cool, OK. Right. In a year, that works. Right. But that's a different relationship. I'm not trying to create a relationship with them. Because it, it ain't going to happen. And they're not. They don't want to roll the way I want to roll. You know, How was their customer experience? Um, thus far, the customer experience on the product is good. As it relates to investors, it's bad. <laughs> it's really bad. Um, but I think the product is that good, and the clinicals are that strong, and things are working that well. They'll get. But that's not the right. That's not my person. You know, to work with. You know, um, you know, I, I'm excited about working with uh, entrepreneurs who actually have the right perspective about. It. You know, treating my money as if it was their money, and having some transparency around it. You know, again, you know, knowing the difficulty of diverse leaders being able to, you know, get uh, funding to do their stuff. I, I saw that, but I just saw some special stuff in this guy. You know, he said, "Hey, there's some special sauce here." You know, hey, if he, if he would like a little, you know, working together or mentoring or whatever you want to call it, I, I have time for that. You know, I've got time for good folks. I've worked with enough bad ones, <laughs> you know? You're like, I don't want that person to succeed. You know? I mean, they will succeed, but I sure don't like it. <laughs> you know? and, and they always top out, because eventually what happens is their inability to effectively lead people catches up with them. You know, their technical skills and their success drive will get you a certain distance. But to get to that next level, um, that requires um, a little more uh, team ability skills. And so, you know, 
you'll find you. You'll see your peers. Some of them really move, but they will plateau if they can't keep growing, can't find a way to value people and value the folks they serve. So uh, how do you like find these folks, right? Like you talk about a West Coast, East Coast, like do you just like go talk to these people in conferences, call them for coffee and like, Yeah, you right. Like, you know the the good thing about, you know, uh, life is that yeah. If you are willing to treat people right, um, you are a person who will have integrity in the stuff you say you'll do. Um, and you're fun to be with, and fun to work with. You will create a network of folks. And you know the interesting thing, I had done some other networks and in investing and all of that. And that was cool, but the velocity was higher than the money I had. Um, but what I, I've been able to do over time is my 30 years of what I've put in has created a network that creates an interesting deal flow as is. Um, you know, now I'm doing a few things like this with Clarence says, look, Mark, come on, man, get out there. <laughs> you know, don't, don't be the best hidden secret in town. Why don't you, you know, be a little more out front? Um, but I do think if you're in it long enough, you, you create networks as well. And many of those networks, you know, I got a call on one of these, on one of these West Coast ones and, um, from a cat I'd known Let me hear about it. What is it? Okay, do the analysis. Look at what's going on. Who else is in? You know, next thing you know, then three other things pop from that. You know, even the Black Tech Angel Fund was, you know, through a person who had worked for me at General Mills, and they were actually bringing this organization to Minneapolis, which, oh, by the way, is the number one funded market for, you know, for investment. No, I told them to. I did. I told them. I said, you guys are sleeping this. And they would now. Now that they've got their papers straight, they would love to. But uh, you closed it up. Um, but, you know, so I think your networks also can play a valuable role. But I'm trying to build mine beyond just what I have and meet new people and, and you know, find new relationships. I was just curious, so when you're evaluating like somebody with an idea, like what, at what point in their development process do you like start feeling like you can invest in them? Like, I mean, a, like an idea, is that enough or is like proof of concept or like a functioning app? Like what yeah. level of... <clears throat> yeah, I like to see things that are in the market, you know, and they don't have to be large and in the market, but I need some marketplace people. You know, um, I've got a young man who worked for me at the mills, and he's got a great idea. He pitched it to me, and uh, two of them to pitch. I was like, well, where are we at? Well, where's the product? Where's the box? Where's the, oh, I want you to fund all of that. I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, I love you, man. And I recruited him out of school, out of Wharton, and the whole thing. And I had to turn him down. You know, it hurt to turn him down. You know, but I said, man, you got to, you know, you got to slap this thing forward, man. Put some sweat equity and make do and get this thing in the market. You know better than that. I've had two like that. Um, but I like to see something that's actually at work. It doesn't have to be the final, final. But it sure needs to demonstrate product efficacy, you know, um, demonstrate some of the market stuff. Like, so you, does anybody want this? <laughs> you know, um, I, I think you've got to take it a certain distance. You know, at least for me. Now, there are people who are willing to do that. You know, I, I, I did fairly well at the mills. I didn't do that with just, just, you know, funding basic concepts. So what, um, sorry, <clears throat> so my name is Vinod. Um, so you talked about failure. So what is the lesson that you learned in the failure? Um, can, can, you, can you share your experiences and probably shed some light in our, in our life so we could, we could maybe kind of see through what you saw? Of course, it could be wrong. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, hey, having launched just goo gobs of products at the general, having worked in the New Ventures area, led them both. You know, failure is just a part, you know, a part of the game. Usually, if you're failing, you've got some problem in between the product, the conceptual idea, and the marketplace, you know, and how those things relate to the consumer or the customer. You know, in, in one way or another, you can spin the bottle and it can land in any one of those things. And it can be all of them all together. Yeah, um, invariably, your biggest mistakes are when you miss the market. You actually think there's a market and there's not. And, uh, and that's a big, right? Because 
when that happens, it's because you believe there's a market, mm -hmm. right? And you haven't actually done the hard work to be sure, or you haven't figured out how can you test to see if that market really exists. Then the, the second level is in the conceptual framework of the product, you know, the concept that drives the product in and of itself. And often you are mistargeted as it relates to that key person you're trying to sell to or market to um, or serve. You know, uh, one of the most fun ones we had was um, we were working on the, let's see how, it, I'm going to try to disguise as much as I can. We were working on a, um, a product for, um, for, for people who were older, who were, who were in hospitals and were coming out of the hospital. Right? And what you find is that people, there's a high percentage of people who actually think the surgery is successful. They get home, and either because of poor nutrition, lack of hydration, lack of attention, they actually end up coming back to the hospital because of the lack of attention and poor nutrition. And so we um, connected with United Health Group. And the cost on this is incredible, right? I mean, the cost to go back to the hospital is you know, 10 to 15 thousand dollars, right? Just for you know, just for stopping in and for business, staying the night. Your cat eat well, nutrition. So we said, well, wow, we can create products under the Betty Crocker label that would actually help people by, it's already in your refrigerator the day you get home. All you have to do is take it out, eat it, and get ready to grow. Right? Now your nutrition's safe. And if we could just cut that rate of people coming back from that 10%, even a point on that, you know, it was incredible, two points on that, given it's ten to $15,000. You know, I mean, the cost of the food is nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Right, going in, and we can sell this baby crocker kitchens. We work with UHG, and uh, they're, you know, they're optimum, you know, because they know this is a problem. Okay, so what really happened? We knew it was a huge market. We knew there were people who were interested. We also knew that there were um, caregivers like me, with my 90 year old mom, who's worried that their parents aren't eating well. Worry, you know, that things aren't right and you're living a thousand miles away. So you had a customer who wanted it, right? You had a company who wanted it, the healthcare system. We made food. This thing should work. And you got folks going to the hospitals all the time, churn, churn, churn. Should have worked. You know what the problem was? The person receiving the product did not want it. That's yeah. Right? You couldn't get anyone. Folks who are old, they say, I'm going in, I might die. I don't even want to give my credit card to do it. Secondly, they concluded, if I get this Betty Crocker stuff and it comes into the house, delivered efficiently, my kid may not come see me. <laughs> so UHG, we're working the design on this test. We could not get a sample of people to do the test. Because every adult who was listening was like, whoa, you want my credit card for what? Well, I'm not even sure I'm going to be here, so I don't even want to get it. And then they're thinking in the back of mind, if I do this, Scoop won't come by and visit. And that thing was DOA. Great idea. And caregivers would spend anything to make sure mom is well. Right? That's the least of my problems. What I can't do is be there. Dead. Tried three times. Right? It's still a great idea. We have not figured out actually the novel approach to solve it. I'm on my almost bed. Somebody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. We got some pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Somebody's going to leave here. Yeah, <laughs> Somebody's going to leave here and be like, hey, let's have it. Right? So like you think of the cost of the food and having it delivered, have someone put it in your refrigerator for you and get it ready before your surgery. Everything's cool. You right? sell, sell it to the kids instead. What's that? You sell it to the kids instead. Yes, we did try to sell the kids, but boy, <laughs> folks didn't want it coming in. They want that relationship. Right. Just more like a personal level, you know, I want to see my, you know, son or probably grandson to come see me than, yeah. hey, you know, right. automatic refrigerator. Boom. So we check market big, margins high, need high, companies interested, insurance folks are willing to pay. They're willing to pay us with the stuff, right? Just to cut this rate down, right? But well, we couldn't make that, that consumer fit with, with what that was. We were unable at that point to figure that out. So you, you're so what you're saying is your first check in is when I figure this out. Yeah, call. <laughs> call. 
And there are people working on it. I mean, trust me, it's that big, right? And Neil's on wheel. I mean, you got people trying to figure this out and trying to do it in a different way. So there's usually something that's not quite right with the market, the product delivery, and the conceptual frame of what's going on. And it just depends on which particular <laughs> business it is. But when it's not working, it's one of those three things, or you're going to be one. Were the meals prepackaged? Yeah. yeah. Under the Betty Crocker, and they were family kind of meals. For, you know, think about first person 80 years old, you know, stuff they want to eat, mm -hmm. that they grew up with, right? It's so they now like, eat like, the spread of food, like, if you're too. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't okay. it wasn't hospital food. The stuff tasted good. It was, it was good. The <laughs> issue wasn't, was it good? The issue was, I, I, I don't know. It tastes you know. like loneliness is the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that's a good receipt approach. Tastes like loneliness. And then the fear, <laughs> giving my part of the fear of, I'm not even going to be here. Right. I mean, I get out of this place. Right. You know? mm -hmm. I ain't signed up for anything. Right. Wow. That's just crazy. So there's always a mismatch somewhere in that space. Um, and it's sometimes it's harder to figure out. Uh, so most young people come out of college, that is, assuming they graduate from college, they have a the Yeah, well, you know, and A, I'm an old dinosaur, right? So, you know, where we were was different. Um, I, you know, uh, I went, I was at Dartmouth College, I went to the Wharton School, I was straight through. Okay, so I'm 21 years old, and I'm trying to decide you know, well, I'm almost 23. Nope, 22. I mean, literally, I've got an MBA from Wharton School. 22, not even 20, you know, 22, not even 20, 23 years old. And I'm trying to decide what am I going to do with my life, right? So uh, let's be honest, we don't know. Um, and I didn't really, uh, the only two options I thought of was doing the CPG thing um, or doing some kind of a consulting thing. And um, I just thought, gosh, you know, my first dream was to work for Mattel and make toys for kids in the, uh, in the consumer package of toys for kids. And for some reason, those cats uh, wrote them letters. I did everything. Couldn't. They didn't respond. So I said, well, here's a company that actually, at that time, General Mills actually, you know, we owned Kenner, Parker Brothers, Footjoy, Monet, Izod, um, Red Lobster, Algar. We owned all of this stuff. And I said, wow, you know, okay, if I go here, I should be able to bounce around and I'll be able to work in a variety of different things just beyond, you know, beyond just food. Now they spun off all those other things and then eventually spun the restaurants off and became just a food company. So I thought I could go one place and really learn how to run businesses and do stuff. And, um, you know, I wasn't worried that this was my last stop in life. I honestly thought I'd stay a year or two and come back home to New York. You know, it seemed like the right thing to do. Um, it turned out that it was more fun than I thought, actually running businesses, doing advertising, making, making products, working with product development. Um, that was more fun than I thought. And I also figured out over time that I was pretty good at it. And things were working. And you know, my folks were such that they said, look, these companies, this is like a, here's the deal, it ain't a marriage. Here's what they're supposed to do, and here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to work hard, make them better, and everything you do represent the company with integrity and honesty. And um, you know, um, and what they're supposed to do is pay you fairly, so you don't have to look over your shoulder and give you opportunities to grow. And if you got that working, this is a good deal. And in marriage, it's a real good deal. They can give you opportunities to grow as a person, pay you fairly, so you don't look over your shoulder, take care of your family, you're good. You go out there and work your butt off, add some value, make those cats some money, represent them right. If you've got that, you're good. And I just kept it that simple. And I just kept moving up. You know, and I finished as a guy who worked in the exact wing as the EVP over global strategy, and a marketing, and business development. You know, and, um, but that was a good deal. I mean, I was like, this is great. And now I look, and maybe it could have been different. Um, but, you know, we had an old style pension. <laughs> getting paid, you know, all the stuff that they don't offer anymore, right. they all had, right. and, um, and I was learning, and I worked in m and I mean, I worked in global, I worked on all these different areas, I 
was able to raise funds and do deals, start groups. So, you know, I don't know if it turned out, I think it turned out to be the right thing for me. I don't know if that's the right thing for everyone. Um, I knew I didn't know anything. So I thought going to a place that actually did stuff and could teach me it was a great teaching company. I thought that would be great. And, you know, take a car. You know, and I kept taking a car and it kept working out. So, you know. I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Was there a word that you enforced within the company that kind of helped you with? Yes. That is why you have a book like us? Yes. Um, there is a guy, Gary Rodkin. Um, you know, when I first came, you know, again, coming to Minneapolis in 1983, there wasn't much diversity, so it was really kind of funky. Um, and I was thinking about leaving after my first year, and I got this guy, Gary Rod, came to be my boss. And Gary was from uh, basically Trenton, New Jersey. He's an Anglo cat from Trenton, New Jersey. His best friend was Drew Pearson, his wide receiver from the Cowboys. And so he actually understood brothers, you know? And so when I got there, he was like, hey, Mark, man, I know how to roll, man, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, this is going to be great, man. Glad you're here. Which was very different than what I was getting. And so, um, interestingly enough, you know, he, his leadership, the way he went about things, and he understood people of color. And it was great to work for him. Then he'd get promoted, and I'd keep working some other place, and eventually he'd say, hey, I want that guy back. And he ended up getting promoted a number of times, ran a division for General Mills, left, worked at PepsiCo, ran Tropicana, and then became CEO of Conagra. And so he was my mentor, not only while I was there, but after, um, after he left. And the mentoring was even better then because he didn't have any skin in the game. Um, but that guy saved me here in this town, you know, because he really, my mother still asks about Gary Rodgers. She's 90 years old. How's Gary Rodkin? <laughs> you know, and a friend, I, I met this guy yesterday I never met before, and he said, I worked with Gary. And we just yucked it up, you know. So I think people, they matter. And um, having someone who's willing to take that extra time, that teaches you a life lesson, you know, about developing folks. So I always kept my door open, you know, for people because I knew what one person could do to just turn it a little bit and get you going and give you something heard. One person in the world, tremendous. You know, we live in a world where, you know, every, everything's so negative, but let me tell you right now, one person can make a difference in somebody's life. You know, and each of you can be that one person in someone. At the level you're at, doing what you're doing today and later. You know, you can be both. That's a great question. So we have to wrap up here. Oh, man, um, wow. I know it goes fast. Wow, um, okay. Uh, I can't tell you how thankful I am to have you.